podcast. Podcasts are for you to discussion and tutorials about nerdy topics that people who aren't necessarily nerdy themselves. With you today is my is your myself, your nerdy tutor, George, and an expert shoe hanger, my mom. <laughs> I like that. Expert well, shoe hanger. Yes. Well, I mean, I yeah. mean I'm Pretty sure you got them well hanged. I mean, it's to drain the blood usually, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I teased last time that we're talking about a topic that would be in the stars. Now, there's two topics this could very well be, but it could be a wide range of topics here. Today we're talking about Star Trek. And we'll eventually talk about Star Wars later. Um, I want to say probably as we get close to one of the movies get re- getting released later on this winter. But Star Trek itself is a fairly dense topic, and I apologize ahead of time for this. So I'm going to be talking pretty much in very broad scopes for the most part of what Star Trek is and a little bit of the stories behind it. Um, But every single kind of little... Every kind of single little kind of generation could be its own podcast. As far as... How many generations are there? I basically divided into about three different types of uh, three different types of generations. You have the um, the original series, which is like the twenty third, which is the set, takes place in the twenty third century, but basically the twenty second during the twenty second century. So okay. then you have uh, the next generation sort of modern series. Uh, you have the next generation kind of series which is West, my, Wesley Crusher Wesley Crusher Jean-Luc Picard sort of era okay. this is, all takes place in the 24th century but this includes start the next generation and Deep Space Nine and Voyager so this is kind of like the 90s right there essentially okay um, and then you have the the more current Star Trek here which includes the movies and then you also include um Star Trek Discovery, which is a show that which is a show on CBS's um, C- CBS Access, which is it's kind of like Netflix for CBS shows, um, as well as the movies, because it very well takes a lot of influences from the uh, more modern Kelvin movies in a lot of ways. I've not uh, seen a single Star Trek movie. Well, that's okay. I've I've, I've seen all thirteen. There are thirteen. Yeah, but not in the way you would think here. Okay. So, all, right, all right. So let's all right. Look, so let's get so let's do a quick tutorial here. So, um, so Star Star Trek itself was created by Gene Roddenberry, um, way way back in around the nineteen and sixties years. We're talking about nineteen sixty four, nineteen sixty five is when he started having it here. Um, the original pitch here and was basically wagon to the um, wagon train to the stars. Now wagon train used to be. An older show. I remember Wagon Train. That's I don't. Yeah, you wouldn't. Oh, it's fifties. Yeah, so so Wagon Train was basically this notion that there was a family and collection of people in a wagon train, kind of like heading west, and occasionally they would stop and meet different people along the way. And a lot of times in the show, in the Wagon Train show, it was a lot of different celebrities and like things like that. In a lot of cases, that you would eventually stop at and meet, but they were all doing, doing obviously like. Western sort of bits. I mean, yeah, the Western was the, is the modern day sci fi movie of the modern day sci fi of so sort of cameo appearances. Very much, okay. yeah. There's a lot of there. Um, that was the intention here, um, and every episode was supposed to work on kind of two different levels here. One was supposed to be kind of this morality level in which um, you discuss kind of somewhat some kind of morality in, in the course of the episode, and another episode was supposed to be this. Suspenseful adventure, as Gene Roddenberry initially planned it out. Okay. So we get to again what I call kind of the original Enterprise, twenty second century kind of, kind of genre, kind of period of the show here. And this is where I think where a lot of people who first start started with Star Trek, your generation included here, would probably know it a little bit better here. So this is going to be the what we um, have colloquially all called uh, TOS, or The Original Series. So oh, that's is, cute. Okay. So this is William Shatner as Captain Kirk, Leonard Nimoy as Spock, uh, DeForest Kelly as uh, Dr. McCoy, these characters, essentially. And, um, in fact, actually, what's interesting about this one here is that the Enterprise ship itself, this iconic sort of ship here, it actually been existing for about... Ten years before this crew ever started, 
the notion is that um, so the basic notion of Star Trek here is that there's this organization called Starfleet. It's kind of like a UN nations of the world and, of, of the galaxy here in this case. So it's made up of all these different planets and people and they all work together to make these ships to go and explore space, essentially. Star Trek, it's, uh, Starfleet itself is an entirely a peaceful organization that's mostly unbent on explorers, discovering new things, science kind of like... Boldly go where no man has yeah, gone before. pretty much, and it's um, very altru- altruistic. Okay. There's no money in the future... You know, like, a lot of, like, our common... Like, everyone just betters themselves for the sake of bettering themselves. Um, things like that in a lot of cases, so... So it's a fantasy. Very much. I, I, again, as if, like, as if we could get rid of money and yeah. corporations and politics. Psh, crazy people. Um, but um, in the universe here, there exists a couple different bad guys, kind of. You have the Klingons, which is kind of... Semi-barbaric, you know, civilized race which conquers everything kind of in their way. Like, how dare you stand in the way of Klingons? And then you have uh, the secretive Romulans, which are like kind of spy sort of like guys that are like hide in plain sight, and because they're related to Vulcans, mm-hmm. uh, which are another race in here. They're um, but Romulans are bad guys as well. Uh, Vulcans, because I mentioned them, are basically was what Leonard Nimoy was. It's basically this emotion... Not necessarily emotionless is not the way to put it here, but... Um, they're all reason and logic. Yeah, and no emotion. Yeah. The intent is because their emotions are so great that when they have them, uh, they have them in like rather like powerful bursts. But Spock is half human. He is. So Jane, he, Jane Wyman is this one. Yes. Depending on... So, yeah. So, this is what we can consider the original series. It ran originally from 1966 to 1969. It was not that popular when it was running, unfortunately. I mean... Um, well, and I'm surprised to hear you say it only ran for three years because it, it was showing when I was a girl. Yep. And it, I remember it. I and, and perhaps because it ran in reruns for so long. It was actually the number one rerun show for nearly two decades. Really? Yeah, based off of uh, Nielsen ratings and metrics from back in the day here, like, and again, keep in mind, like, Nielsen for what it was is basically just people telling telling other people what they thought they were watching, whether they, there was no real metrics behind it at all. So Niel, the Nielsen ratings here, for the most part, are you large. Got, well, we, no, we, we did Nielsen ratings. You got a sheet that had every show on it, and you had to tick what you were watching. Precisely. But like, whether you were actually watching it or not, in some cases, was is a different matter. Oh well, we were pretty honest. We must, some people were again. I mean, there's, there's not really a whole lot to fumble on that. But again, I mean, it was one of those shows in which like, which just radically progressive in a lot of ways. It dealt with a lot of tackled with a lot of civil rights issues. It was one of the real first casts that had an integrated sort of cast, like you had. Uh, Captain Sulu, which was a Japanese guy in the 60s, considering mm-hmm. just maybe 20 years before they were in internment camps. In right. Internment camps, you had, um, uh, you have, uh, in, you had, you know, Aurora. Lieutenant, you had Aurora, uh, Uhura, which was a Uhura. black woman. And then you also had, like, uh, Chekhov, which was, you know, vaguely Russian, Slovakian, sort of like, Sort of thing. You during, had it, during the Cold War. During the Cold War. And then you also had, like, you had Scotty, who was, you know, uh, Scottish. Mm-hmm. Which is um, quite unfortunate here. Poor, poor Scotty. Nickname name was Scotty. Why did you, you call him Scotty? Because he's Scottish. Uh... Well, but, you know, Chekhov is obviously, in, yeah. So you, you, had, you had a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but, but then you also you also had aliens, not just Spock, but you had a lot. Of, then again, you had more aliens on the show here too, and that was very progressive in its own right. That these were people that they had met. Starfleet again doesn't conquer anybody; basically invites you into the Federation. And you know, like again, very progressive show that dealt with with a cat, very multi 
multi-ethnic cast, which is one of the first times that ever happened in in that era. It's a little sexier than than we were used to seeing too. Oh yeah, those uniforms did not hide a whole lot. Did not uh, hide a whole lot there. Well, but, but also some of the topics and some some of how they showed men and women, I think, were a little mm -hmm. more um, progressive. Yeah, but again, the time. yeah, again, progressive would be the uh, the optimum word I would use for that in that particular case here. Okay. Um, so again, yeah, it's also a, so again, it only lasted for three seasons, but oddly enough, it was very very popular in reruns. It's actually what started a lot of fan conventions and as we've talked about before fan fictions um fan conventions here in this case here if you went to a star trek convention you were a trekkie is the term for that um uh, again every 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 fandom's got its own kind of unique wording for its fans um but no uh, but again as we better than being a brony true well, 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 uh, some would argue okay um but no Good yeah point. if you go if we go back to our fan our episode when we talked about bronies and fan fiction, again I mentioned that Star Trek was one of the first major fan fictions that ever existed. Yeah, that's and, true. And this is again like an again based off of this three season sort of show that just aired in reruns year after year after year for twenty years. Um, there was an attempt to bring it back because originally it got shut down because it kind of cost too much and it was a little too radical for the times um because obviously they're on sets and it's this sci-fi sort of thing here and that does cost some money mm -hmm. yeah um but we do get uh an attempt to try to bring back the show in an animated form airing for really for two seasons there was an animated series again on cbs almost all the original cast reprised their roles and their positions here um not well received, if you as you can. Don't imagine. remember a single episode of it. Yeah, probably because it doesn't didn't didn't air in reruns. It happened between 1973 and 1974. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's not considered canon. Okay. By way by way of saying like it's meant to say that like it doesn't really matter in the continuity. Okay. Um. Now again, no. I mentioned there are 13 movies. 13 Star Trek movies here. And based off how well the based on how well the TV show was still doing, they did Star Trek the Motion Picture in which they were able to get all the original cast to reprise their roles. And they were capable of doing another movie and they were capable of doing a movie which was kind of cool on its own, right? And when, after the When was this? Don't seem to have it in my notes here, oddly enough. I apologize. Um, but this would have been in probably the late 70s, I want to say. Yeah, because I'm trying to think if you got all of the original cast. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I don't remember it, but I wasn't I wasn't a Trekkie. So, That's fair. Yeah. So, yeah. so you have uh, the first motion picture here, which was a big deal. And based off that, they were able to do a uh, second movie, which is the mo kind of a, the most beloved of the original Star Trek um, cast movies here, which is Wrath of Khan. I do remember Wrath of Khan. Yes, so Wrath of Khan. Uh, the big deal with Wrath of Khan is that uh, Ricardo Montalban, who yeah. had been a character in the original series, reprised his role nearly 20 years late, in, not 20 years later, but nearly like 15 plus years later, and reprised his role as uh, Khan, as Sigmund Khan, and was hunting down Kirk and his crew. So it was very much beloved. It's also the movie in which Spock dies. But the next movie they go, next movie is The Search for Spock, and they go and resurrect Spock, I guess, is the, what ends up happening here. He's undead. He's a zombie. Well, the third movie is also the episode, the movie in which the Enterprise gets blown up. It's kind of self-destruct, and they blow up the Enterprise. Um, we get to the fourth movie, which is kind of an interest, another uh, fun movie here. It's The Journey Home. Um, and basically, in order to get home, there's an alien that's attacking Earth that only really makes whale noises. And they can't translate that. So in order to save Earth, Captain Kirk and his crew have to, using the stolen Klingon ship, uh, spaceship, 
circle the sun to go back in time to the 1980s Earth, collect whales from Earth, and then come back. I vaguely remember this. Parts of it were shot in San Francisco. Yes, it was all shot in San Francisco and the Monterey Bay, um, in the Monterey Bay um, Aquarium. Aquarium, yes. I vaguely remember this. Yes, it was probably on TV quite a bit. Okay. Um, there was a fifth movie. We don't talk about the fifth movie. It's very weird. Why? Because it's a lot. It deals with a lot of. Apparently, it deals with Spock's brother, who is. Um, not emotionless like him, and he's got a lot of vague, weird, pseudoscience, religion-y sort of topics. One one thing that Star Trek was pretty good about was not talking about religion for the most part. It mostly sticked with, like, hard science for the most part. And even... Well, and, and, and as much as it was very moral, I remember it sort of being a religious. Yeah. 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 Religion was really one of those things that it didn't talk about all that often. Um... If only just because even now, I mean, I think I find religion to be very divisive. Um, yeah. But the fifth movie is a little wonky like that. Okay. And then we have a sixth movie that happened in the early 90s here, which would have been um, The Undiscovered Country. It's the movie here in which um, the, Kling the Klingon's moon, one of the Klingon's moon, which is where they get a lot of their uh, power from, like energy and everything, blows up. And as a result here, the Klingons are basically semi-crippled in a way as far as power production goes and minerals for their battleships. And they make a peace with Starfleet here in uh, United Federation of Planets. And it's basically hinted, and it's basically how they get to peace. But there's a plot to kind of make sure that Klingons and Starfleet don't, don't get to peace at all. And so Kirk Okay, so what, what's the time period for this? Um, so this still all again, this is all happening in kind of the 22nd century. Well, I mean, but, but when did this come out? I, I'm just trying to see if it times with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, I think it was 92, 93. Which have been it, right afterwards. Yeah, cool. so probably right around then. Okay. I remember because that's the movie, because I remember going and raking leaves throughout the entire neighborhood. neighborhood to go buy tickets to go watch that movie with my dad for his birthday, oddly enough. Very good. So yeah, um, but so that's primarily what I what I consider the twenty second um, Enterprise kind of kind of a uh, series here. Okay, we get to what what I consider the modern nineties version of Star Trek, which was basically the notion was that we get to Star Trek: The Next Generation from nineteen eighty seven to nineteen ninety four. Um, by the time they finished filming the fourth movie here. They realize that it's kind of expensive to keep getting uh, William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, and this original cast together here. Mm -hmm. And so CBS, so Paramount Pictures, which was at the time uh, working with CBS here, decided they wanted to create. Let's create a new show. We'll make we'll get other actors unknown we'll, unknown actors, and we'll get them cheaply, and let's just create a new show. Uh, CBS was initially totally up for it, but didn't want to have a new cast. They wanted to just reprise the original cast. And so this is where we get the uh, breakup between Paramount and CBS, where Paramount instead decided to start showing it on independent channels. Syndicated, channel, yeah. Syndic in a syndication format. Yeah. Um, and the initial intent was, we'll give you the first season of free, but we, get, but, we get to pay, but we get to buy the last 10 minutes of commercials Oh, interesting. Yes, we'll give you the shows for free, but we get to buy the last. We get to buy. We get to own the last eight to ten minutes of commercials, and then if you get and if it continues like that, then you have to make a commitment to buy every season after that. Yeah. So, so if it takes, yeah, which so, it did, which it did. Yes. Now again, um, the voyages of the Enterprise D, which so there was like. Okay. So again, in the original New ship. Series, the, now, what is the, what is the the model you've got here? The one I have in front of us here is the Enterprise E. Okay, so we haven't come to that yet. Sort of. We're, we'll kind of have it in this, okay. in this uh, modern era. So, uh, the Enterprise D again. I mean, it was also they again reapproached Gene Roddenberry again to do this here. So Gene Roddenberry's uh, intent and vision is all over this thing in a modern setting. Okay. This is where we get 
um, where we get Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard, captain of the USS Enterprise D. Uh, we get Jonathan Franks as William Riker. You get Michael Dorn as Worf, who's a very popular character in the Star Trek uh, franchise. He is a Klingon, so originally he was a bad guy. But he's actually raised by on Earth and part of Starfleet, so he has all the characteristics of being a Klingon, but he's a nice guy. He doesn't smile. Yeah, well, I liked him. Um, this is also where we get uh, LeVar Burton as Jordy LaForge. A lot of us reading up, Rainbow. Reading Rainbow. A lot, if you watched uh, a lot, if you watched any sort of uh, PBS as a youngster, you were like, "Oh yeah, no, that's the Reading Rainbow guy." So yeah. um, we also get Brett Spiner as Data. Again, Will Wheaton as Doc as Wesley Crusher. Crusher. Um, and then obviously we still obviously have his uh, mom. Uh, Beverly Crusher, and we have uh, Deanna Troy here. So we have quite a motley cast here. Um, the, everybody and all these characters are very well beloved. And then obviously, um, this is how we learned of who Patrick Stewart was. And when the show finally ended, we got to uh, see him in other shows. <coughs> so basically, this is what launched Patrick Stewart's career. Well, okay, let's back up there. Okay. There are a lot of people, I, I remember it at the time, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people absolutely aghast that Patrick Stewart would do this show because he was a of, beloved Shakespearean yes, actor. a beloved Shakespearean actor. In his, late, and oddly enough, in his like late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. Where the rest of the Macbeth. cast was, which when a lot of the other cast was in their mid-20s here. But like, Patrick Stewart, again, has been... Somewhat balding since his like teen year, since yeah. his like his early twenties, which works out well for him in Shakespeare because it allows him to just put on a wig or no wig, so he can be older yeah. characters yeah. right away. Yeah. Um. So yeah, no, this is what kind of starts his, um, not necessarily propels his career, but again puts him in kind of a main. Gets his, yeah, makes him well known. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Again, reintroduced you know Star Trek to a modern to a modern uh, audience here in the '90s, created a whole collection of fans, myself included. I remember uh, parking myself in front of the television on uh, for syndication, and on some nights you could basically watch reruns of Star Trek: The Next Generation, a new episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation, and then Deep Space Nine. So you had like a nice three-hour block of just solid like Star Trek, which I thought was cool, but I'm sure in that. Hindsight, it was, uh, gee, why is he watching tel all this television? That's okay. You had good grades. I tried. Um, so what's interesting about Star Trek here is that, the next generation here is that it's very episodic. Every, every episode returns back to a, what they call a status quo, and you're moving on to the next place. No episode really affects the next episode in the show. Or, it was true of the first one, though, too. Yeah, very much true of the first you, one. They're all standalone. Yeah, every episode's standalone. And the intention was, again, very much a rag wagon train in space. You go from one place to a new place to a new place. Uh, we get to see a lot of our familiar friends. We get the Klingons, which now, if you remember in the original series, they didn't have like that. They didn't. They, didn't, they were very dark skinned, was the way I yeah. would describe it. So there was kind of a. Um, which didn't obviously do well, which would it play well in the 90s? Yeah, race had come along. As, so as, by the time as, we get to the 90s here, the Klingons are, again, predominantly, I would say, predominantly played by um, African-American, black people. But there's this giant ridge thing that they got going on for a forehead, which denotes it as being more alienish. Okay. And you see a lot more of their kind of uh, battle garb and outfits and everything and it, it looks re it looks much cooler than it did in the original series right yeah um romulans come back as well uh, but we start seeing some new things like we see ferengi which are these large oh. giant eared short shorter guys um i don't want to say they're an analog for jewish people back in the 90s but they very well could have been um but these guys are all about money trade Steal, they literally stole their tech, their warp technology and, or bought it from other people. That's how much these people are, like, money people. Um, and there's also uh, the Cardassians, which are one of my favorite races. They have these 
um, scallops that kind of go up their neck. So they have like these wide open shoulder sort of things that go up their neck. They have a little forehead thing kind of uh, thing as well. They're very pale, um, but they're very militaristic. Now, at what point do you get um, seven of nine? So that's Voyager, and that's also another... Okay, so uh, that's coming up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but there's also another race, again, that, that tops off to the Boar, which are this machine-like race of uh, people which basically go in, take what they want, and transform the people into other Borg drones. So they inject them with nanites that turn all their blood into robotic kind of blood, and the rest of their body sprouts pipes and tubes and mechanical sort of bits throughout their body um and so it's kind of um kind of like uh the undead or zombies in a way um like if you kill one great but you if you kill a person great but they just come back as a zombie but in this case if you they get a hold of you recycling yeah if they get a hold of you though they turn you into a to another drone um their starships are kind of cool because they look like because they're basically giant cubes, but they're all patchwork of different technologies and plating and stuff like that. It's got this very kind of, as if you, if you describe like color schemes in a lot of cases, Starfleet's very much this blue, white, and red, sort of this kind of semi-American sort of like yeah. patriotic sort of colors. Uh, Klingons are kind of like a black and red sort of thing. Um Frank, um, Frank here, this like orange and yellow sort of tones. You have the Rom, you have the Cardassians, kind of this uh, black and yellow, and maybe a little bit of this like rich kind of like dark purple sort of look. Borg are this like gray and neon green. It's sort interesting because it, at one point someone had explained to me years ago that these different um, alien species really were intended to um, mimic um, different countries that yeah. we were dealing with. So, so, and I was told the Ferengi were really the Saudi Arabian oil yes. people. Yeah, so the, all these different races would have been analogs, Analogy. yeah. a, analogs for different other cultures here, absolutely. So, um, again, I mean, I... Ferengi, or again, Ferengi probably would have been Saudi Arabia, I think. Um, or oil-rich countries, anyway. Yeah. Well, again, people with a lot of money there want to buy and get their way into more power and more money. So, um, What was Data? Data was an android, but he was unusual in the sense that he was a kind of self-learning AI computer in hosting a body that was just apparently super strong and could take a hit really, really well. Okay. Um, and again, it's very... So he's, he's what AI could be. He's, it's, 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 the, it's the belief that this is what AI and robots will eventually become, is that they're so human and lifelike that they learn and react to everything around them um, and are just a part of everyday life here. He's obviously the very first one, Um but that it's a he's kind of a unique position in which there's none other like him. The person that created him is dead right. or doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so, like, eventually he gets a emotion chip built into him, which allows him to have emotions. Um, he doesn't like the emotions initially, but he eventually tries it out later on and comes to appreciate some emotions, or at least, at least able to empathize better with human beings okay. uh, as it were or as fellow cast members here um, but again very very popular it's, this is the this is the show that popularized what they call the cliffhanger ending oh. so in season three um, so in season so in season early in season two uh, there's a character that exists throughout the Star Trek the next generation continuity called Q He's basically God, as it were. Um, oh, I can't remember what he, the guy who plays him here. Um, the guy who plays him is perfect. He's fantastic. He play, He's played a lot of other roles. You, you, um, um, I'll. I know who I know who Q is. I remember being being really, I mean, because I did not watch Star Trek, as you well know, but I'm familiar with Q, and I remember him being sort of omnipotent. Yeah, so he's basically an omnipotent kind of God, uh, as it were. 
Um, he can um, basically anything he wants to do is um, is at his whim. I mean, he could blink and turn you into a machi mariachi player, and um, he could transport you anywhere around the galaxy. He's basically omnipotent power in a sort of like. Not like a stage show sort of uh, carnival barker sort of way, but he is a bit showy though. His oh, personality oh, yeah. is very flashy. Very, um, but yeah, no. So Q originally, so the entire series actually starts off with Q who is judging Jean Luc Picard as representative of humanity. That's the very first episode, um, and Q occasionally pops in here or there as kind of necessary throughout the show. When I guess they just want to have like a semi supernatural sort of element here. Uh huh. In this case here, like Jean Luc Picard is talking with Q and saying like, you know, human beings, we're ready for anything. We're ready to do anything in the in the universe. We're we're ready for it. And Q is like, oh, okay, well, I'll take you up on that offer. Sends him to the other side of the known u galaxy and universe here into mm -hmm. so all the events that normally happen in Star Trek happen in what they call the Alpha and Beta quadrants of the universe. Okay. They shoot him off into the Delta Quadrant, where eventually Voyager takes place. But this is where they get introduced to the Borg and quickly realize that they are no match for the Borg. They are technologically uh, uh, they inferior. They are technologically inferior. They have no chance of stopping the Borg. These Again, Borg are, I mean, are going to come at you. They're going to get at you hard. Um, Borg even don't even most starships here have like shields Borgs don't even believe in shields they they basically will figure out what the what kind of weapon you're attacking with and basically nullify it so when it hits them it doesn't do any damage to them at all they just kind of like shrug it off they adapt to it shake it off shake it off so, so this happens in season 2 where they meet them come season 3 Starfleet's trying to develop like anti Borg sort of tech measures here. Um, and the Enterprise, being the flagship of Starfleet, it's the number one ship you want to be on in command or even be on it at least. Mm -hmm. um, finds out, you know, Starfleet finds out there's a cube coming. There's a cube coming for them. And so they send out the Enterprise to go intercept it and try to stop it. Um, and along the way, they take Jean Luc, they take Jean Luc Picard, they take Captain Picard. And they turn him into a drone. Ooh. So they turn him into so they turn him into a new character called Lacutus of Borg, who was the representative and voice piece for the Borg. Now beforehand it had been this kind of like chanting sort of like voice that kind of happens in like this out of like a computer terminal. Like none uh -huh. of the drones talk, but it's just all this like intercom sort of like we are the Borg, resistance is futile sort of talk. Okay. Now you know, Patrick Stewart now as Locutus speaks for the Borg. Now they've developed a, a weapon to try to stop. They're the, sort of a hive, aren't they? Very much a hive. Okay. So um, they're going to they develop a weapon to the Enterprise has developed a weapon to stop the Enterprise and stop this cube here. And the very end of the episode is you know is Commander. Uh, William Riker, who is now captain of the Enterprise, because he was the number one, he was the first mate, mate yeah, or the uh, was what they might call the uh, executive officer, and um, he basically says fire, and then it fades out and says to be continued, and we want to get another continuation of it for another like four or five months. Ooh, wow! Until, yeah, so this was the end of season three, going into season four. And a lot of the cast didn't know who was going to be coming back for the next season. A lot of the intent was kind of that, like, oh, Patrick Stewart's really old. It looks really old. Why don't we have William Riker as captain? Because he's a lot more fun and he's a lot more younger. And yeah, maybe this is the guy we want for, for this role. Um, well, fans made their voices well heard. They didn't want to get rid of uh, Captain Picard. They love him. He was pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Um, come back to the next episode here, um, and because Jean-Luc Picard knew about it, the Borg knew about the weapon that the Enterprise was going to use against them, 
disables the Enterprise and decides, nope, we're just going straight to Earth and leaves them. And along the way, before they get to Earth, uh, Starfleet amasses about 40 or 50 ships to try to stop the Borg Cube. The Enterprise can't catch up because it's got to make repairs to its uh, systems here before it can catch up and rejoin them. And this is a very famous battle called the Battle of Wolf 359, or 459, I forget which. Um, and basically, the Borg Cube just kind of like arrived in this sector with all these other ships waiting for it and trounced every other ship and turned this place into like a literal starship graveyard. Um, it's pivotal because a lot of what happens in this, even though this battle, which doesn't last very very long from, you know, the episode point of view, leaves a huge lasting effect on Starfleet and everybody on, on the rest of the quadrant because the Starfleet, they're very altruistic, they're peaceful, they're scientists, they're explorers. Yeah. And they quickly realize that they've got to switch their mind thinking of how they build ships now. Because they can't just keep they building... They need to be defensive. They need to be more defensive, a little bit more militaristic. And so they, this is where you start getting more powerful starships, more warlike starships as well. Um, eventually they get back uh, Jean-Luc Picard. They remove all the Borg tech out of him because it's still very, it's very fresh in him. Only like mm -hmm. a two day, maybe two days old. So it was still easy to re remove all the stuff out of him. They destroy the board, but they will meet him again. Okay. Um, when it comes to movies here, um, we have four movies for Star Trek, the Next Generation cast. You have um, the seventh one here, uh, which is the... I don't remember the name of the seventh one here. I really I really ought to, and I don't. Um, okay. But I'll put it in the show notes here. Okay. Um, basically, this one here is that um, there's a ribbon, which if you get into the ribbon, you get like an omniscient sort of like heaven-like state, I guess, or world. Um, and people don't. And people really want to get into the rib into this ribbon that kind of passes through the universe randomly. Is this is this like a like a like the Milky Way galaxy is a ribbon? Kind of like that, yeah. Like it just okay. kind of runs through stuff, and uh, there's a guy who really wants to get into it, um, but can't. Um, it's where it's basically it's the movie in which you get Captain Jean Luc Picard and Captain um, Kirk working together for for a couple. Uh, 1994. Yes, 94. And it and it is referred it, it is the Star Trek Generations yes, movie. Yes, there we go. Yes. Um, so yeah, so that happened right after the original uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation ended in '94. They had a movie for it. Has a lousy Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, oh yeah, no, it's not well received. Well, eighty-six percent liked the movie, but its Rotten Tomatoes scores in the forties. Oh yeah, no, no, again, it's, it was not a well-reviewed movie. That's. The follow-up movie about two and a half years later here, which is Star Trek First Contact, which again brings back the Borg, is very well received and liked. It's one of it's one of like the better, it's one of the better Star Trek uh, Next Generation movies here. Okay. Um, there's a ninth one in which again I don't remember the name because it doesn't leave that much of an impression on me here. Okay. Um, I got you. That uh, basically there is a planet which kind of keeps its people there. Uh, in kind of a somewhat ageless sort of state here and there's a race that like basically is dying that wants to get on this planet really badly but it's also protected by the Federation because it's in a weird nebula sort of thing and so like the cast Insurrection of, Yeah like it's again not a really well received one here um, uh, as far as the movies go and then there's a the tenth movie here which Oddly enough, the way you can tell good Star Trek movies is usually the even number of movies. So, like, Search for Spock, or excuse me, uh, The Wrath of Khan, uh, The Journey Home, Undiscovered Country, First Contact. These are all very good movies in Star Trek here. So, the tenth movie here um, in this franchise, which dealt with Romulans and Jean-Luc Picard and... Uh, 
was not really was, didn't, was not well received, unfortunately. Well, here's the, there's an, on, there's a, a site called Digital Spy that ranks, and this is just this is really recent. This is November of 2018. Ranks all 13 Star Trek movies, mm-hmm. 13 of them, um, and it puts Final Frontier. It says Final Frontier is the worst. Yeah, that would have been number five. Okay, number five. Okay. Um, oh, this would have been Star Trek Nemesis. Is the tenth one here? Well, that's that's number twelve in their ranking, so yeah. that's the second worst. Yes. Um, Star Trek: The Motion Picture from nineteen seventy nine is number eleven. Yeah. That's Generations is number ten, which you you said you kind of liked. I kind of liked, but again, I mean, J.J. Like, J. Abrams was the director. No, 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 no. That would have that would have been the the, the Star Trek movie. Uh, there's there's other movies that come out. Um, okay. But no, no, that one is. Uh, but no, generations. Then I'm assuming. Insurrection. Insurrection. Yep. And then the search for Spock is number eight. Yep, sounds about right. Okay. Um, Beyond. Yep. Is number seven. That's a fairly recent one. Yes, that's the more newest. That's one. Of, that's the newest. 2016. One. Okay. Yes. Um, Undiscovered Country is number six. Yep. Uh, Into Darkness. Yes, that would have been the uh, 2013 uh, Star Trek movie. You are correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Voyage Home is number four. Yep. Okay. I'm assuming... First Contact is number three. Yes. First Contact number three, so that I'm assuming um, number two is is going to be the Star Trek movie from 2009. It is. It's number, Star Trek number 11. Yep. Yep. From 2009. And then, so number one is going to obviously be Wrath of Khan. It is. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that that ranks. Nicely about, done. Yeah, that's about what I would picture the ranking as for from a fan perspective. It is. It is regularly mentioned in the same breath as Godfather Two and Aliens in terms of most stunning sequels. Ooh, it's a pretty good uh, company. Well, again, I mean, like, you have a lot of room to grow when the first one was not that great. Yeah. Yes, but still With, within reason. So still, if you Godfather Two and yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so. Uh, so yeah, so that that was Star Trek: The Next Generation. But what happened right away after that was in 1993 when they kind of realized that the cast was getting uh, they'd been around for a while here. They decided yeah. that you know what, let's have another Star Trek show. And the real notion was is that you know what Star Trek's really popular. Let's have more Star Trek shows. So they created what is my my favorite Star Trek series, and a lot of people will fight me on it, which is Deep Space Nine. From 1993 to 1999, uh, what's interesting about uh, Deep Space Nine is that it doesn't take place on a starship which is traveling the universe. It takes place on a space station, Oh. which was originally a Cardassian space station that was overlooking the homeworld of the Bajorans. The Bajorans are this very... Not necessarily altruistic, but this very religious society uh, race of people. Um, they look very much like humans, but they have a little ridge thing on their nose. Um, and they oh, wear, I do remember And they them. have like these very bangly earrings that kind of like hook around with rings yeah. and kind of chains. Like the earrings. They, they wore the, the cool robes. They wore there were some pretty cool robes, yeah. Um, so what ends up happening here is that. Uh, we have Avery Books as Captain Benjamin Sisko, one of my favorite captains, because he's willing to get stuff done and doesn't care who's in his way. Okay. Um, and he's the commander, eventually captain of this space station, which um, the, his intent there is to prepare the Bajorans for um, integration and uh, invitation into Star into uh, United Federation of Planets and Starfleet. Um, but along the way, he gets kind of tapped beca- to be the messiah and prophet of the Bajoran religious, you know, order. So he's got a, kind of a dual role as being both the spiritual, as being a spiritual leader. Sort of the Pope? Um, not quite like the Pope, but more kind of like a, um, a prophet, I guess, as you were, this, this literal title. So like not necessarily not necessarily Jesus, but more the kind of like um, like a Paul Luke sort of sort of situation. Okay, so got if, it. if that got makes it. sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I got it. So, um, I'm just surprised that you getting religious on. Well, this 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 
this show is actually very, not very religious, but it has a lot of religious overtones in the Bajoran sort of um, religion here, which plays a very big role in the station, because the station is made up primarily of one part Starfleet and another part Bajoran. Bajorans actually own the space station, but they lease it out to Starfleet for protection. So kind of like Turkey letting us have, uh, having a, having military a installations. Okay. Precisely. Yeah. Oh. So, um, what's interesting is the originally the, 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 this, uh, this original space station is actually Cardassia, Cardassian in nature. Now Cardassia had ruled over Bajor and is kind of like, had like basically taken it over and was strip mining it for all of its wealth. The space station is actually a mining, uh, space station. It's initially designed okay. for refining minerals and mining. Okay. Um, but when Starfleet obviously takes control of it here, um, from the Bajorans here, it's, again, all Cardassian technology, which is a little weird initially, but eventually gets, it's a very unique architecture. They don't believe, like, one of the big things that you'll notice is that um, they don't believe in ramps. A lot of the doors you have to actually step over to get into. Um, everything has a lot of this very curved architecture sort of thing. Um, a lot of round things that are in there here. Like the entire thing is just a giant rings at a certain level. They're in the gamma quadrant. Well, so not exactly. So what ends up happening in the first episode here is that, uh, the captain, Benjamin Sisko and, and one of his, uh, first officers here, one of his, um, fr- uh, colleagues here, uh, Lieutenant Dax, um, accidentally discover a stable wormhole. Now, wormhole is basically a tunnel that connects two points in space and allows travel between it here. Now, before this, most wormholes were not stables, but which is the way to say that if you went into it, you popped out on the other side, you couldn't guarantee that if you went back into the wormhole, you'd come back out the other way. The same way. place. Yeah. Okay. So, or even that the place that you came out of would even be there still as a place you went through. Um, a great a many of people were lo- are lost to wormholes in space. Uh, they're not common, but like the intent was always to make a stable wormhole because it allows very easy movement through space, which would be very ideal here. Um, but they discover a stable wormhole that goes to the Gamma Quadrant, and they reposition Deep Space Nine near the wormhole um, so that way they can monitor what comes in and out of the wormhole, but also create trade and commerce with, through the wormhole, which makes up these things that ended up becoming a very um, important place in the wor- in the universe here. Um, the reason I like this show is that while it is somewhat episodic from episode to episode, it's also serialized in a way. So epi- each episode you could almost watch on its own, but every season's kind of got a story that kind of arcs through it, oh, which plays a larger okay. part into this major one here. So uh, we've never actually in Star Trek ever seen a war at all. We've heard, oh, Starfleet and, and Klingons had this massive war for many, many years, and we never saw it. Now we get to see a war. So um, in the Gamma Quadrant, we meet a race of creatures known as uh, changelings, and they've got an army called the Dominion. And the Dominion doesn't like people being in the Gamma Quadrant that's not changelings. And so, um, Cardassians, which we see a lot more in this series, Mm -hmm. are everywhere because they're so close to Bajor. Um, There's a lot of Klingons and Romulans and Klingon sort of relations that happen. The... uh, Klingons, Romulans, and Cardassians decide we're going to launch a massive fleet through the wormhole to go stop the changelings and the Dominion. They are don't... they are they mining for? Is it because there are resources they want? Well, I mean, what's the reason? Well, they really want to. I mean, like they really want to. Everyone wants to kind of have a bit of a foothold in the Gamma Quadrant. It's a new part of the. You know, for that from their neck of the woods, like. There's not really a whole lot of places to expand outside of your own borders. And maybe there's something of vested interest in the Gamma Quadrant that's going to 
change the universe, maybe a new dilithium crystal to power starships, maybe a new technology, maybe a new race that's worth, you know, making allies with. You don't, nobody really knows. It's so, okay. so, so basically the Spaniards in 1600. The Spaniards, the... Well, you had uh, Spanish, Spaniards, the Portuguese, you had the, the British French, in there. Yeah, the Europe, yeah. The yeah. English here. Basically, they're trying to get a hold of, you know, the Caribbeans. There as we go. it were. Okay. Uh, well, the people, the, to, to create this analogy, uh, the people on the Caribbean islands don't want them here. They're, they've got a lot more firepower and they wipe out this huge massive armada that's made up of all these different people. And so the Dominion have actually been making small forays into the Alpha Quadrant, as it were. As basically like, hey, we're the guys from the other side. You really don't want to mess with us. Please don't bother us. Yeah. Um, eventually what ends up happening is that uh, the Cardassians make an agreement with the Dominion to basically take over the Alpha Quadrant, as it were. And so at one point here... Deep Space Nine gets taken over back by the Cardassians. Where is Earth in all this? Um, what quadrant are we in? Well, Earth is in kind of like the very kind of middle zone between the Beta and Alpha quadrant. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's in okay. what they call the Vulcan sector, oddly enough, because Vulcan, because the Vulcan homeworld's like just like a short, like eight, like a very very short, like three hour trip, I guess, a four or five hour trip. Oh, cool. Okay. It's basically, like going, going to LA. Yeah, pretty much. But it's like going to LA and then you get to Vulcan. Okay. Uh, you make a left on the 101, though. There, there. Um, I 5's quicker. Uh, in theory. Yeah. It's just nothing to see on I 5. I know. Bored. Okay. Um, so eventually, yeah, so Earth's quite a bit of ways away. It's not really, it's very much in what they call the core worlds. It's very deep in, in Starfleet sort of uh, territory. So it's not likely to get anybody getting to it very easily. Um, but along the way, so you have the Dominion and the Cardassians working together. They take over Deep Space Nine, so literally all the cast is to leave, except the Bajorans cast, they have to all leave Deep Space Nine. Um, and the intention is that um, they've mined the area around the wormhole to make sure that no Dominion fleet comes through it at all. Uh -huh. Or if they do... They have these mines that will stop them. So they're trying to, um, basically they're trying to get a foothold here in the Alpha Quadrant. Eventually the Starfleet goes back and they save Deep Space Nine, they reconnect with Bajor. Um, and throughout this entire thing, war eventually, the Klingons rejoin with the Federation here as far as being allies. Same thing with the Romulans. Romulans were not allies with Starfleet for poor, but they eventually convince them to do so in a somewhat underhanded method, actually. Um, uh, basically, Benjamin Sisko fakes the death of one of their ambassadors by the Dominion and convinces the Romulans to join with the fight here because it's in their best interest. But he has to lie to do it. He literally has to trick them into into joining. Into how do joining. how do fans feel about that? Since since I mean, the, I mean the one thing, and this is where the wagon wagon train analogy really works for me, mm -hmm. is I like old westerns um, because they were very cut and dry. Yes, about right and wrong, and and I can see where Star Trek was very moralistic, very oh, yeah. cut and dry about right and wrong. Mm -hmm. How do the fans? Feel about that? Yeah. Well, they've been playing Benjamin Sisko as kind of not this rebel without without a cause, but um, there's an episode much earlier on. So there's uh, so between Cardassia and the the Cardassian Union and the Starfleet, there's a border kind of area which is what they call the neutral zone. Basically, anybody can live there, and, and the notion is that this is a buffer zone between these two. Uh, sort of a demilitarized. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's colonies on there. Colonies get attacked every so often by Cardassians. You know, even though they're like, no, no, no. we It wasn't us, but we also don't have warships in there at all either. Because this is the demilitarized zone. It's the neutral zone. So, like, um, and there's these Starfleet colonies on there. Well, when... Starfleet basically makes an agreement with the Cardassians to 
have this neutral zone here. Um, the Cardassians still harass these colonists, and the colonists don't like it. They're a part of Starfleet, but they don't like being harassed. Yeah. So they take up arms against Cardassia, but because Starfleet's because they're technically a part of Starfleet, um, Starfleet is obviously like, hey guys, don't do that. These we're, are our we're, allies. We're peaceful, yeah. Yeah, these are our allies. It's like, well, look what they're doing to us. Uh, eventually, it gets to the point here where they end up rebranding himself as the Maquis. Which is a vaguely ter- a vaguely terroristic sort of thing where they steal Starfleet tech or use their Starfleet tech to fight against the Dominion here. Starfleet's kind of okay with it, but not really. Um, there's a great episode in which there was a Maquis guy that hid himself in in Deep Space Nine. It was like a, an assistant to the captain, mm-hmm. Benjamin Sisko. And turns turns to the other side, and he's been hunting this guy for a while. And he finally decides, you know what? In order to in order to get this guy to actually show up, because he keeps taunting me, mm-hmm. I'm basically going to bomb a planet and make it unlivable for the next sixty years. And he does it. How many people does that? Kill? It doesn't actually kill anybody because he warned the planet beforehand that, like, hey. This is what's going to happen. It's going to make your this planet unlivable for the next sixty years, and they all leave. And they all get out. There's okay. not a lot of colonists on there, but they all leave. Um, it's still not very nice. No, it's not very nice, but it kind of well within his parameters and power and abilities okay. to do stuff. Um, again, I mean, like it's basically kind of Starfleet's land. At the end of the day, they can do whatever they want to it, but these are all, in a sense, a terrorist terroristic organization. Okay. He doesn't really want to do that either, but it's kind of the only way to get this other guy to show up. This other guy finally agrees, you're like, fine. Sounds a little like the CIA. Kind of, a little. Yeah. Benjamin Sisko's really like this captain again, like I said before. We'll do kind of what's necessary to get stuff done. Okay, so he may be a little more strategic than the uh, than we're allowed to see the others be. Well, he's a little more amoral. Okay. Yeah, he he understands that like this is a war and that some things in wars are not great things to do, but you have to do them in order to win the war. And without the Romulans, you're not going to be able to win the war. Okay. It's a great it. episode because it's basically him narrating his law, his captain's log into the records. Mm-hmm. And at the very end, he deletes it all. So he deletes his log. Oh. So, it's like, so he never actually tells it at all. Tells it what he actually what actually happened at all, because obviously if that had happened, the Romulans would just be you know it would just be mortifying. Yeah, yeah. And so this tenuous peace and this tenuous agreement to fight their common enemy is enough right now, because the intent was that the Romulans were like, well maybe we join the Dominion, and while we don't like the Dominion, it gets rid of our enemies, which is the Vulcans, Starfleet, and the Klingons. We'll be a lot happier. Yeah. You know, or we'll, self-serving. Or what we'll do is we'll wait till you guys fight each other out. We'll wait to whoever wins, and then we'll come in and swoop in and kill the rest of whoever's left over. Yeah. So, um, the very end of the show ends up happening where they end up defeating the Cardassians in the Dominion. Um, but um, oh, there's this great character named Gold Ducat throughout the entire show of Deep Space Nine. Um, he's the major. He's the main antagonist to Benjamin Sisko. Um, and essentially what ends up happening here is that um, to tie it all back to like this pseudo kind of religion sort of thing here um, they end up back on Bajor at this weird temple called the Fire Temple where these uh, bad religious uh, sort of things are happening so um, so um, in the Bajoran religion here, essentially, there's the prophets, which are these wormhole aliens that made the wormhole. Mm-hmm. Um, that Benjamin Sisko is kind of a, the em, what they call the emissary. So he so can speak and deal with them. He, he can speak yeah. and deal with them. And, they, and he often does in some cases. Um, he's, he's the one that agrees to, like, look, make the wormhole stable for us to go through, and it'll be great for everybody. Yeah. Um, but there's bad aliens called the Paul Wraiths, which want to take over the wormhole and thus like return to the right what they think is their rightful place yeah um so 
Goldicott's been taken over by the Polarites, and Benjamin Sisko is kind of the emissary, the voice of the prophets here. They kind of fight it out and get lost in the temple and get kind of banished away, as it were. Oh. So he disappears at the very end. Um, again, one of the reasons I like the show is it's got this kind of pseudo-religious sort of theming throughout it. Um, and interesting that the, the show with the most amoral captain... Mm-hmm. Well, not necessarily... Well, the most amoral captain, but he's still very much a Starfleet captain. Okay. I mean, it's not, it's not, I mean, like, there's other he captains. Do, he, he's doing what he has to do, but he's having to justify it. He has to justify what he does, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, there's, other captains will lose well later on, but it's one of the, but again, the, one of the great things about this here is that um, it's a very militaristic kind of show that kind of really does show off, like, this religious aspect of how, religious tolerance and working within this religion kind of confines kind of works because uh, the religion in the show is very much overwhelming in some cases for some characters like um, his first officer which is a woman named uh, Kira Nerees excuse me <coughs> is Bajoran and on one side she sees a man who's her commanding officer but on the other side, she sees him as his, as her, um, like Luke or Paul, or like almost as like her, you know, like her. Right, religious because he figure. is a sorts of prophet. Yeah. Yeah. So he's a. Is she's as she also sees him as a religious figure as well, and as much as he doesn't really like that kind of uh, connotation to him, like it's it's true. Yeah. Um, there's this great balance later on that happens. A great episode, I think, in the first season here. Uh, first or second season where they create a school on the station to teach the young children. There's not, because again, I mean, like, it's kind of the Wild West in in a way here. Like, there's a bar, there's the shops and everything, and so they create a school because there's a bunch of new children on the station that should have a school. Right. And they allow families in deep space here, so why not have a school to teach the children? There was none beforehand. Um, And this religious figure kind of comes in and asks them, why are you you're teaching about the wormhole? Why are you not teaching about the prophets in the wormhole? It's like, well, we're teaching facts. We're teaching about science. You know, Uh-oh. religion religion is not yeah. fact. Yeah. You know, it's like, but it is fact that there are prophets in there. No, they're aliens. And it's, so there's this great episode where it creates this giant divide between. So all the Starfleet kids stay, which is like five or six of them and all the Bajoran kids leave which is like nine, ten, twelve kids. Yeah. And it creates this very empty classroom at the end of the day that almost makes you wonder whether it's worth it having a classroom. Because now all the Bajoran parents won't allow their kids to go to school at all and they think that they're being taught the wrong thing at the end of the day. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of very, yeah, this very moralistic sort of episode like you know even even the main char- even some of the main characters are like you know like Kieran Reeves who's very much a soldier at the end of the day it's very much like you kind of have to teach the prophets about you have to teach the children about the prophets in the wormholes like but that's not science it's like i don't care whether it's science or not it's what we believe in yeah you can't teach them about something that we don't believe in yeah you know so it's a great episode in there um right after so moving on to the next show here Right after deep, right after Next Generation ends, they decide, you know what? We still need to have more Star Trek on the air. Let's create another show. So right after Star Trek The Next Generation ends, the next year in 1995, they have Voyager. So Is this Christy Alley? Uh, no, 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 no. That, that, that was uh, Wrath of Khan. Oh, okay. So, um, no, so Voyager is the first time we see a female captain. So yeah, so keep in mind, I mean, when we get to Deep Space Nine, it's the first time we see a black captain. Now okay. when we get to deep now when we get to Voyager, we see a female, female captain. captain. Um and this is the uh USS Voyager. It's an intrepid class starship. It's one of the first new starships to really come out of Starfleet in a long time. That's like got a lot of brand new tech on it. As were like uh the Enterprise D, which had been around for a little bit, is a was what they call a galaxy class ship. It's very much like the Cadillac of ships. Mm-hmm. Uh, Voyager's kind of like the uh, Prius of ships. Oh, I like Prius. 
Yeah, it's very yeah. versatile. It's a science vessel, so it's a lot smaller than the Galaxy, which were like the Enterprise D, if you can imagine, had like 2,000 people living on it at any given time. Mm -hmm. Voyager's got maybe 150 to 200 people living on it at any given time. It's a much smaller ship. Okay. But it's got like a lot of the more newest technology that they have. A lot of it developed from the Battle of Wolf uh, 359. Um, Benjamin Sisko, obviously, I, I didn't mention this before, is from the Battle of 359. He was on a starship over there that got attacked and destroyed there. So he's from that. Uh, but this starship is one of the first starships to come out that are um, not necessarily based off of the, um, the battle, but a lot of the creation in it comes from that battle. No, not... Oh, well, if we're going to have a starship here, even if it's a science vessel, we need to have more weaponry on it just to be safe. And we need to have the latest shielding and armor and stuff like that. Um, so this series is unique in that, um, whereas I mentioned the Maquis, which is like kind of the semi-terroristic sort of agents of Starfleet, but not really of Starfleet. Mm -hmm. Um they are escaping the Cardassians, and they end up going into this um, field of space, which is very unnavigatable normally. Okay. And end up getting transported to the Delta Quadrant. Now, Voyager goes to try to find them because it's got one of their um, crew members on board, which is kind of hiding in plain sight almost. Hiding is basically hiding on board. Mm -hmm. um, they go to try to rescue him, and they also get transported to the Delta Quadrant as well. Um, in the process of going to the Delta Quadrant, uh, the Voyager crew loses a lot of its members in an attack, and a lot of their staff dies. But what ends up happening is they end up um, rescuing the Maquis crew, and they join the forces together. So the Maquis crew joins the Voyager crew, and they become and, you know captain of the Starfleet, but the first officer is Maquis, so they're kind of working together to get back home. Okay. By rationale for them to get back home was seven, 70,000 light years, which would take about 70 years to get back home. Okay. Um, and so they basically have to travel from the Delta Quadrant back to the Alpha Quadrant, and with no refueling, very little supplies, or what they don't already have on them, and get back home. They eventually do, but it's a long process to do that. So, um, but this is a show in which, again, you mentioned Seven of Nine. Okay. Uh, she she comes from this uh, show here. She's originally a Borg person, but she's one of the few human Borg people in in there. Okay. And it comes to find out that originally, her family were studying the Borg and traveled out into space to go and find them against Starfleet's wishes. Um, they traveled for so far they eventually found the Borg and were studying them and the little girl and the little girl at the time got captured turned into a drone and grew up as a drone okay um, she's got a name I can't remember the name off the top of my head she's got actually a very long number designation they just end up deciding to call her just seven of nine to make it easier okay um, to just to talk to her essentially. I found her fascinating because she is human but she's not really human no, she's kind of been a little bit of an analog for, like, I think Data in a lot of ways. Where, like, she, where yeah. Data was quite human in a lot of ways, but clearly not. Um, Seven of Nine is very much of a bore. She hasn't had a lot of natural human she, communication. No social, no social, no social, social skills at all, no. Um, and unique as well is she's, because she's not actually a Starfleet officer at all. She can't wear the Starfleet uniform. But she's got this very, very tight skin suit. Yes. Which I can't imagine being comfortable to wear for, for too long. Wasn't um, meant to be comfortable. Well, well, if you notice throughout the entire Starfleet here, nobody's got pockets. Makes no sense. No, 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 doesn't make any sense. There's no pockets. But again, I mean, like, in, in their mind, like, what would you hold in the pockets? You don't have a wallet. You don't have any identification because, like, that's You're in your... You're chipped. You, you, well, you have a comm badge that has all your yeah. information on okay. it. Okay. Um, there's no, I mean, in the only reason that you would have pockets would be to hold on to stuff you find. But in a lot of cases here, like you would have like a pouch or some sort of bag to hold it in, some or some sort of like medical case to like, oh look, I found a rock sample, perfect. 
But you don't believe in money, so you can't. You don't have car keys either, so pockets sort of don't make any sense. Pockets always make sense. I think so too. Um, so what eventually ends up happening with Voyager is that um, is it doesn't take them seventy years to get back. It actually takes them about seven years. But in the process of doing that, they find little shortcuts along the way. So they find. Um, if they were just plot a straight line through, it'd take them seventy. It'd take them seventy years, but they find little kind of um, eddies to kind of go through. Well, they're playing shoots and ladders. Yeah, they're basically they find little shortcuts along the way. Yeah. Um, what's interesting about their show, the reason kind of like they why they put it in deep into the Delta Quadrant was basically to give the um, crews who were working on uh, uh, Deep Space Nine and Star Trek The Next Generation to give them something new to work with. Because again, if you had dealt with a lot of Klingon, Cardassian, Romulan sort of stuff here for a long period of time, we're all familiar with that. And this is supposed to be an uncharted part of the world, so it was a lot more of um, new alien races, species, things like that to, to try to do again. Because um, even so, but, so you could uh, unwind your creativity a bit. Yeah, so you could have new creative stuff here. And they created a lot of cool new races that are kind of out there as well. So, um, you have a very, you have like a hunter series, which is very much about collecting trophies at one point. Um, you have another one called, uh, I think, I believe it's the Kazon, who are very, um, very kind of tribish in a lot of ways. And every Kazon, like sect as they're called, they have like slightly different morals and values, but they all kind of like proving yourself as like a hunter gatherer sort of thing. Um, technology in the Delta Quadrants far and few in between in some cases. Um, so, you know, but again, like, and they're having to explore new worlds so they get resources because they have none. Precisely, and that's and that's one of the other things. Like they they if they didn't they, didn't, they don't have to stop if they don't want to, but if they don't stop, they don't find new resources, um, food in a lot of cases. Like, so that's one of the interesting things to talk about here is that. In Starfleet here, by the time we get to the 23rd century, they have machines called replicators, which make all their food based off of a kind of a protein, vitamin, supplement sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But they can make it taste like whatever you want. Yes. So if you wanted like pasta, you could have pasta. If you wanted a steak, you could have a steak. You have basically anything you want. It would give you the perfect size portion for who you are and have the perfect amount of calories built into it. So again, you could have like Nothing but ice cream, and you would be perfectly fine. It would be a healthy diet. Probably not the most desirable, but you can have a healthy diet that way. Um, but the replicators also allowed them to make other non-trivial items. So, like, maybe, for example, <laughs> you need uh, you need a hairpin. They can make a hairpin for you. Or if you need to make um, a new tricorder, you can make a tricorder out of that because it's got certain components that are there as well. To like make, a digital printer then. Yeah, it's very much a digital printer that can make just about anything you realistically need. Now, it does have some limitations to it. It really, it's, um, you have to be like a high-ranking officer to make weapons out of it. You can, but you need special materials to do it. Okay. Um, it can't recreate torpedoes or other major systems parts in some cases. Some things just can't be replicated because of the materials. Because okay. you need to have the original materials to do that first. Right. Um, so Voyager is very much stuck in the sense where, like, they're going to need new fuel cells. They're going to need to re find replacements for parts and find a way to make those parts fit what they have already or, right. or their systems here and basically get from point A to point B. Um, to me, it's one of my least favorite Star Treks. Um, if only just because, like, I don't, I don't really care for the crew in the most case. Like, I, I, I just could not, I just don't care for the crew and it's, uh, and sometimes the characters are one way one episode and they're a completely different way the next episode. So not very, not very good on continuity for the characters. Okay. Um, one of the, there's a famous running joke here that in the, one of the very first episodes, they talked about how they had a very limited supply of torpedoes. Torpedoes being these one things you can't really easily recreate. And to get more of them, you have to visit a Starfleet base to get more. Yeah. Um, and there's a 
I believe about a six or seven minute long video that highlights every single time they use a torpedo and a counter that tracks how many torpedoes they have. By the end of the show, they're negative 200 plus torpedoes. So when they said, oh yeah, we only have like 39 of these left, we better use them sparingly. There's some times in which, like, yeah, full burst of torpedoes and like fire off five torpedoes at once. And we're just like, ah. Um, eventually, um, they find little shortcuts here so to get back and forth. By the end of the show, they're still like about 40 plus years away from getting back home. Um, and they've been dealing now more commonly with the Borg as a, as a major enemy. Um, and barely scraping out of it alive. In one case here, they actually allied with the Borg to get past this sort of stuff here. Um, and so they eventually find a way, they discover what they call a transwarp hub, which is a okay. basically the... Basically, the Borb has something called Trans Warp, which allows them to travel much faster than regular warp speed, um, which is how they get from place to place much right. more easier. Um, it's basically this kind of tunnel network, which basically, depending on which way you go on the tunnel, will shoot you out to different places. And so um, Voyager gets back to the Alpha Quadrant by going through one of these tunnels and returning back to the Alpha Quadrant. Um, but not before Voyager is met by 30 years in the future Catherine Admiral Janeway who travels back in time to Voyager to save Voyager okay so the new Voyager when he goes to, to fight the Borg in this last episode he's beefed up with like very late era 24th century tech so new weapons shielding stuff like that you hear that makes it pretty much that the Borg are like, oh, well, we can't get through, we can't beat you now, um, sort of way. Um, and Voyager end up, ends up becoming a uh, classified starship uh, for research because it's got all this future tech on it, which is very much against the um, code of contact, conduct of the uh, Starfleet. You're not supposed of to mess the Federation, with, yeah. Yeah, you're not supposed to, they have what they call a prime directive. Right. You're not supposed to interfere in the politics of another culture. Yeah. Without permission or being invited, yeah, um, you can't uh, what they call what they deem pre-warp civilizations. You can't tell them that you exist in a way. Like you have to allow them to naturally develop. So you you couldn't be like all chariots of the gods. Yeah. No. You yeah. yeah you cannot. Um, you can't. You can't influence non-pre-warp um, societies. So yeah. the intention being is that these societies need to develop warp technology first and then once they develop warp technology you can come in and be like hi we're your neighbors okay but until then you can't like kind of come into there it's um kind of i i'm trying to find, I'm trying to find a good way to it to do the analogy here it's I guess it's like the Amish finally figure out electricity and motor cars and so finally you can come and be like hi we're your neighbors sort of, yeah. i guess maybe yeah yeah no i get it if that's the best way to describe it here. Um, so, but when the other thing is also you don't mess with the timeline. So you can't go back. If you go back in time, you have to get out of going back in time and get back to the future and not mess with stuff in the past. You can't change outcomes. No. No. So, because um, you don't know what radical change would have in the future. Butterfly effect. Precisely. And much the same way, if you go to the future, if you bring back something from the future you're not really supposed to have it because you didn't really develop it at all and who knows what the actual technology is if you tried to what consequences yeah if you tried to recreate it what would actually happen yeah um so yeah that was a um what was interesting about this show is one of the first times in which you had a um they started using more cg effects uh, for their starships and stuff originally all the starships were giant models that they had to film oh they're famous for that and apparently the models sell for i mean when they when they become available so they were, auction for for lot for, for hundreds for of, of thousands of dollars yeah um there's this great little history channel sort of uh retrospective on it and because they did a christie's auction for it in 2006 where they sold a lot of props and stuff from the from the from the tv shows 
and all the models went for very, very expensive. Yeah. Um, which was kind of cool on a certain level. You're like, well, wait, wait, right on. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Star Trek Voyager was the first time in which they started using more um, CGI models for a lot of their stuff here, which can be a little wonky in some cases because um, we would really love to see a... They, they've, done a, they've done an HD version of Star Trek The Next Generation. We would love to see a... Um, HD version of Voyager and Deep Space Nine, but because they used a lot more CG models, mm -hmm. um, part of the problem here is that they were downgraded to like a 480 quality, and to bring them up to like a 1080 quality, um, you basically need to redo all these effects yeah. from scratch again, and so um, there's a lot of money that would have to go in to do that, and do you lose some of the, the magic that was in the original version of that, kind of like Star Wars does? Yeah. When you go from the original to, like, yeah. the more newer stuff. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, yeah. Um, the series is a little divisive among fans. Again, my, myself included. Like, I'm not a huge fan of Voyager, but I see where its plot, where its place exists in the universe um, of Star Trek here. So, within reason. Yeah. Um, so, then we get to kind of a more, the more, mo the more recent, more modern stuff here. So after Voyager ended in um, 2001 here, essentially, um, they, they still decided, you know what, Star Trek's still very popular. Let's do more Star Trek. But the show writers were kind of done with dealing with the modern setting of Star Trek. And they decided, you know what, let's go back to the very beginning. And so we go back to the um, 22nd century, very mm -hmm. early in the 22nd century, with the NXT Enterprise. So this is like the first real starship that the Earth Federation forces have made. They're not they don't have Starfleet yet, but they're getting so, to that. So so we're sort of a prequel? Very much, yeah. Okay. So um lasting for four seasons, Star Trek Enterprise, originally just known as Enterprise, um, was supposed to be kind of like how did we get phase how did we get like torpedoes? How did we first meet the Klingons? Like answer a lot of these questions um, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, now does it hold on to some of the characters? No, no none okay. of the original, again, a uh, no, brand new cast, again, obviously, because it's easier to pay them, pay a brand new well, cast. Right, but I, I guess by that I meant some of the character names, like a younger uh, Spock. Um, no, again, this takes like this takes place in the 22nd century, so basically before, the, the okay. 21st, in, during the 20, 21, like, XX out of years. Okay. Um, they can go, the, the Enterprise is well-renowned because it can go at warp five for more than six hours, which is unusual because most starships can't go beyond warp two or three. Okay. Um, Good to know. Yeah, so in this case here, it could take them, it'll take them only like two days, it'll take them maybe like two or three days to get to Vulcan versus that uh, in modern times it takes like five or six hours. Okay. So it's the difference between taking like an airplane versus taking a car, if if that makes a, yeah any sense. Yeah. Or or maybe taking a bicycle versus taking a car. There we go. So, um, it's interesting because this one has a um, mostly develop talks about how we get to Starfleet and how we get to this Federation of Planets, um, how we find uh, a lot more of the events that kind of like shake up into the. TOS timeline, it kind of predates a lot of that stuff here. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big ones here being that they discuss how in the original series, Klingons didn't have all this forehead stuff going on. Versus by the time we get to Next Generation, they have a lot of this forehead stuff going on. And it's decided, and it's assumed here, or at least uh, it's plot that they got a virus which stopped them from growing these ridges on their foreheads. Um, and the Klingons we see in the sh in the in, uh, the original series here with William Shatner and uh, we see with Kirk and Spock here are a faction of the Klingons, but the rest of the Klingons are in their major homeworld. Like they see these non-ridged foreheads as being like not ideal Klingons, like the the least of the Klingons. Okay. But the actual Klingon homeworld is like safe and sound, and they're dealing with their own 
civil war, as it were. So these Klingons are just kind of like bad guys that hold their own little territory, but they don't represent the full Klingon fleet, okay. as it were. Um, it's a little decisive amongst fans. Again, like the first, like it got out of the shoot really well received. Mm-hmm. And then the first two seasons just were not well done at all. Again, like I think a lot of a lot of fans were expecting it to be more like Star Trek and a lot less kind of explorey in some cases. Because again, you had Voyager, which was a huge exploration show. You had Deep Space Nine, which is a serialized sort of on a base warfare sort of thing. Um, fans, I think, were legitimately tired of of Star War Star Trek at this point a little bit. Um, and this, this Enterprise is not well received. Okay. Um, the very end of it, um, season one and two are very episodic in nature, but when we get to seasons three and four, season three literally is a one giant plot that happens over the course of the 20 episodes of that season. Excuse <coughs> me. <coughs> As where season four is broken up into a little bit, little bit more subplots. Um, the very last episode is actually very much um, a lot of fans who are fans of the show find the last episode to be very much a slap in the face to the show at the end of the day oh really? yeah um, so the final episode sees William Riker returning um, but that he is on a holodeck and so in, in the next generation timeline a holodeck is basically this empty room where they have force fields and lights and force fields that project human kind of shapes and bodies and leaves and trees I remember I remember holodeck but yeah. they have um, lights that projected onto it so it looks like you're in a completely different environment or right. dealing with other right. people but they're not it allowed, really it allowed you sort of escapism yeah so if you want yeah. to go to a park you can go to a park if you want to watch yeah. a baseball game you can do a baseball game if you right. want to design the ideal house you can design the ideal house inside there Okay. Stuff like that. Um, but um, it's William Riker going onto the NXT ship here in the Enterprise crew uh-huh. and just kind of like watching as like a outside viewer. Like, oh, I have to, I want to kind of watch this here. Or I want to li- relive this here. So he's literally reliving the events of the Enterprise. Uh, he plays a chef at one point, but then he's just kind of a random viewer of all the events that are happening around him. Um, and this is the episode in which, like, just randomly at the end of the episode, they kill off the captain. Oh. Or not the captain, they kill off one of the, I think, the first officer. Uh, uh, yeah, they kill off uh, Charles Tripp Tucker the third. So they kill off one of the, ma- they kill off a major character. Okay. Okay. Uh, and a lot of fans just felt that it was like just like, oh, and he's just watching this as like, um, like he's reading a book. They, they felt it was a big slap in the face, and I can, I can appreciate that and okay. understand why. Um, and it's now for another like four or five years until we finally get, you know, Star Trek kind of dies a little bit in there. Like, okay, not a lot of stuff happening for Star Trek. Although it seems like like it was always in reruns, in in even even the the original series, always in reruns. Oh yeah, yeah, again. some form of it. Yeah, again, the serialized nature of it, the the episodic nature of it, allows it to be in reruns. It was in reruns, I think, on TV for just like years after it ended. Mm-hmm. Not until like we get to like the mid two thousands does it finally like stop being in reruns. Okay. It's just not, I mean, because again, I mean, if it's just not on television all that often, who knew? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we finally get to we finally get back to. Um, 2009 here, and we get a reboot done by J.J. Abrams. Okay. Um, and this is reprising, this is the the original series cast of characters, but played by new people. So instead of having William Shatter, you have Chris playing, playing uh, James T. Kirk. Instead of Leonard Nimoy as Spock, you have uh, Zachary Quinto as Spock now. Um, and everybody gets recast here, essentially. Now, are they are they the same time period as the original show, or no. before or after? So, what ends up happening here is that uh, about ten to twenty years. Um, so, by the time about so about ten years or so after Voyager ends um, in two thousand nine here, um, or for two thousand nine when the show was was done. 
um, there is a, a there is a so the Romulan star so Romulans a home world their star goes supernova and just ends up destroying their planets their their main like home worlds here okay. it'd be as if like the Earth sun blew up and destroyed Earth Jupiter right. and everything along and and, and the people who survived went on some sort of sort of space version of Noah's Ark. So what ended up happening was is that Spock agreed, Spock was who was an ambassador at this point was trying to help them to stop it and they had a special ship here with a this red sort of liquid where um, if it made contact with the with this uh, exploding sun that it would absorb the energy and basically destroy the sun but it still leave the planets in a stable sort of setting like it would stop okay. the reaction. Okay. Spock wasn't able to do it in time, um, and so that's what caused the Romulan homeworlds to explode and be destroyed. Uh, what ends up happening, though, is that another ship kind of comes by, and some of them somehow they go back in time. So this, you know this Romulan ship, which is twenty fourteen tech, you know, twenty uh, twenty four tech, twenty fourth century tech here goes back in time to the early part of the 22nd century and it's just like it failed as like oh my goodness look at this monstrous thing because it was originally this ship is a uh, mining ship it's meant to collect uh, minerals um, from asteroids okay um, Spock and, and it ends up interacting with the USS Kelvin which is a ship that's in that's patrolling that area in space where it enters um, it destroys the USS Kelvin where uh, unintentionally Captain Kirk is born in mm -hmm. and creates a alternate timeline which is known by the fans as the Kelvin timeline the events of the Kelvin being USS Kelvin being destroyed starts this new timeline okay so um, Spock ends up somehow getting taken back in time as well so Spock Prime becomes a part of this alternate timeline as well um, it's kind of like a um, ambassador from the Star Trek universe oh. I, I, yeah so the movies I mean it's meant to show a legitimacy for the um, movie here that a portion of the old cast is there as well so he's kind of the ambassador from the from uh, the original Star Trek series um, in continuity Vulcans live like three four hundred years so, got it. Um, but you get a lot of like cool people here. You get Zachary Quinton. You get uh, uh, Zoe Saldana, which has been in like I think some of like yeah. the top, like been in a lot of the top movies, uh, the top three highest growing mov movies she's in. I think that's Avatar, uh, Avengers, Infinity War, and Endgame. Yeah, I remember her in in, in, in like... Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh well, yeah, this is true. Um, you have Simon Pegg, who's a lot of fun. Uh, John Cho. Um, and unfortunately, he did have Anton Yel Yelchin, but died unfortunately. Okay. So he was he was playing Chekhov. Oh, okay. So which is why I don't think they've made a lot. Of, they've tried to make more movies after this point here because you got to kind of recast that character and who do yeah. you recast that character, character with? Yeah. Um, but um, the movies are interesting because they're a lot more movie like and action based versus um later versus what Star Trek kind of at its core is. But it's very much in line with what the movies are. If you're doing an action movie, you probably aren't as concerned about the moral tale as you are doing or, an, an action movie. Or even necessarily the politics of everything had it happening in the background here. Or how the, yeah, how it yeah. interconnects with other stories. Okay. So the first one did was, was well received. Um, my only story from the first one here is me and my friends went to go watch it in 2009. Uh-huh. And we got to a certain point, and the movie burned. The actual film projector reels for it burned. Wow, I wasn't. I didn't know they still use film projector reels. In two thousand nine, I know, right? So yeah. the movie literally burns, and we end up having to stop to watch the movie because we're like three fourths of the way to it. We go to watch it a second time because the movie theater was like, "Yeah, we'll let you yeah. watch it a second time." We finally get there, and we're like, and "We get through it, and the next one burns as well." Oh, whoa. And we didn't even In get... In the same place? No, we, we did actually sooner. Oh. So we didn't even get more story. So it took us three times watching the film to finally finish watching it. We got there at like 10 a.m. in the morning. We didn't leave until like 
four or five in the afternoon. Wow. I know. It was pretty interesting. Um, but hey, I got to hang out with my friends all day long, which in which we were originally planning on hanging out just until lunch. There we go. So, within reason. Yeah. But we're all just like legitimately kind of like, this movie literally is out on the first day. We're trying to watch it before it gets busy here. You're just killing us, man. You're killing us. Um, and there was a large theater, too. We were all quite upset. Yeah. Because, um, again, it's the first time we see Star Trek again in a long time. Yeah, I got a bit, had a drought. Yeah, we had a drought for a while. Um, again, everybody was very much well-received in this movie here. Um, so much so that they made a second one here. They made Star Trek uh, Into Darkness. Um, Into Darkness, though, was a little bit more... Um, how do I put it? Um, a little bit more divisive, I think, is the best way to put it here. Um, what ends up happening with this one here is that um, they bring back Khan. Oh. But... Is it Ricardo Montalban? No, it's not Ricardo Montalban. He would have been dead by this point, I think. Okay. Um, but no, it's actually played by um, Benedict Cumberbatch. Which oh. is, I think, is a great choice. Don't get me wrong. I think it's a great choice for it. Um, but it's weird because it's supposed to be a big deal, but the only reason it's a big deal is because Khan was a big deal back in the day because Khan was a character from the next, from the original series episodes, yeah. only there for one episode and then made a reprise in the movie. Yeah. In this case here, like there's no reason to have Khan. Khan's not a well-known person that this crew would have ever met before and that's the only reason so he's not already been been developed yeah developed as a nemesis yeah and again, again that was one of the big deals with uh wrath of Khan here because it brought back Khan, who yeah. was this great character in ricardo montalban that everyone was like oh my god this guy's amazing have him back from have yeah. him back in an ep- another episode and he wasn't able to come back for another episode but just did it yeah because the series uh, series got canceled um, and then you have uh, the third movie here, which is Beyond, mm-hmm. Star Trek Beyond. Um, the Star Trek crew uh, fights against an alien that ends up destroying the Enterprise. Um, they make their way to a planet which they find another ship and they defeat the enemy and get out alive. But then they get the Enterprise A, which is another uh, Constitution class, you know, Enterprise ship, um, but just kind of lightly retrofitted to be a little bit more different okay so um but that's the but that's the movies here which again 2009 13 and 16 um which we later get into the most recent version of star trek here which is star trek discovery okay um this is purely on the cbs uh access uh platform which is uh didn't even know that existed yeah so it's originally was going to was originally showing on cbs but then it moved it to its digital platform here uh, when it wasn't getting great ratings initially. But again, okay. they bought a lot of episodes and a lot of people are still very interested in it. I'm almost to the point where I'm about to get the CBS access, but like, it depends on if they have a third season here. It's well, in the, oh, That's up in the air. Here, here, okay, so here's a question for you. When you join sort of the CBS access, do you have to have a service in order to, I mean, like, how do you watch it? I'm assuming you primarily watch it on a TV or through an app like Netflix because it's like a Hulu or Netflix app. Yeah. So, I mean, so it seems to me like, like, um, because I notice a number of different stations have this sort of access thing, but because I don't have Netflix or Hulu, I can't watch it. Well, it you don't, seems. well, you don't need Netflix or, or those to get it. It's like a completely different thing. Oh, okay. It's like instead of going to a Starbucks, you go into like a um, Pete's. A Pete's, yeah. Instead. Okay. And you get a coffee from Pete's instead, or instead of going to a, or instead of going to a Denny's, you go to an IHOP, or then you can go to a Marie Callender's. Okay. So, um, HBO Go is another example of this, where another another network which streams its stuff online um, for people who don't want to buy their actual network or get cable at all. Okay. Um, and Showtime has this. I think a number of other stations do this as well. I'm gonna have to figure that out because I mean, because I have the ability to watch shows that are running that are on my computer. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so again, like you would you would fire it up like you would another website in a lot of cases. Okay. Or if you have like a smart device or a smart TV, you would download an application which allows you to do it from there. Okay. So, um, or if you have um, like our young, my younger brother John or Mark has a Riku box. Yes, he does. He has everything now. Yeah, but he's also like he's also a nerd as well. Yeah. Despite despite what he may think, he's a nerd. It's it's interesting. He's a cool nerd. Well, he's he's a he's a weird nerd in that he wasn't a nerd growing up, but he became a nerd as an adult. Yeah. Well, well not not the typical nerd at least, but he's a video but, but game no, nerd. But no, he is one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, definitely into it. Yeah. So, um, so Star Trek Recovery is a newer show. You see a lot of its um, design philosophy being literally grabbed from the uh, reboot movies here. Okay. But it takes place even before the reboot movies, so just about like just ten years so before. You find now. out how how uh, we, we get Kirk this, gets Kirk well, becomes we don't, Kirk. We don't see how Kirk becomes Kirk, but we do get to see Spock okay. become Spock. Okay. Um, what's interesting about this one here is that um, where normally the captain is kind of like the main character of the show. Uh huh. Um, this geeks here, it's a first officer that's the main character in this case. So it's a character. Is known as Michael Burnham. She mm-hmm. is a human being that was raised on Vulcan. Oh. So she has all the traits of being a Vulcan, but but is very much a pure-blooded human. That's an interesting right. combination. Um, so the, the entire um, show takes place on the USS Discovery here. It's a... It's a unique ship that's got a special drive called a spore drive. Uh, now, the intention of the technology here is that there is a, what they call the mycenial network, if I'm even saying that correctly, um, is this kind of giant network that connects all the universe together through like this kind of spore sort of thing here. Okay. Just space dust that kind of happens in the background anyways. Theorize that it connects the entire universe together. Um this ship is designed to capture those spores that kind of naturally happen in space mm-hmm. and use it as a propulsion method that basically can transport it anywhere in the universe at whim. Oh. The initial problem, though, is that um, the navigational system, initially they could only do it for very short jumps. Like you could only maybe, where you could use warp like five or six to get to where you need to go. Um within like a couple days, within maybe like a couple hours, Mm -hmm. you could use this to travel there instead. So you could do short jumps, um, but not long distance stuff here. Okay. So it's very much a prototype vessel. Um, It eventually, it has a sister vessel as well uh, that ended up having to destroy because it transported somewhere and it killed its entire crew along the way. Ooh. But they figured out what, they figured out what's going on is that while they can travel on the mycenal network, they need a guy to navigate the network. Okay. And what they end up doing is they end up finding this one alien that kind of exists in the network here and capture it and use it as their navigational thing against its will, obviously. That's wrong. Yes. But the captain is also a very amoral captain as well because he's not actually the captain at all. Um, so I, I, I didn't talk about it cause it doesn't come up very often. Um, but there is a, as much as like the Star Trek reboot movies take place in an alternate timeline, there's also what they, another alternate timeline that exists as well that they call the mirror universe. And in the mirror universe, everyone's kind of the exact opposite of who they were on, in the regular universe. So like, uh, Captain Kirk, who's this very altruistic sort of captain, is now in the mirrored universe is this warlord who is on a ship literally conquering planets and worlds for the Terran Empire. I don't think I like the mirror world. No, it's it's ideal. It's intentional that you don't. Okay. Um in the yeah, and that were in the alternate kind of mirror universe, everyone's kind of the exact opposite of what they were before Ed. So if you were a brave and courageous, you're kind of more meek and more like Smaller in statue. If you were a really good guy, you were a real bad guy in the al- in the alternative universe here. Stuff okay. like that. Okay. Um, what so, eventually, so it was the captain here is apparently from this mirror universe. 
He killed his prime universe self to become and took over his identity and just continued onward and decided to become and ended up becoming a captain. Um, he got chosen for this vessel or he asked to be the captain of this vessel with the intention of trying to take the vessel back to the mirror universe because it could travel anywhere and basically go home. Well, and to use it for evil. I mean, for use it for evil as well. Yeah. Um, the crew ends up kind of stopping him. Um, we eventually get uh, Commander Pike, which is a or Captain Pike, which is the first captain of the Enterprise, mm-hmm. who takes over the Discovery for a period of time as well okay. as its captain. Um, again, the show's a little again the show's a little odd, be- and I again obviously haven't seen it yet. Okay, um, it's somewhat well received by fans though, who have obviously been wanting a new uh, Star Trek here. Yeah, um, but they've not. Again, I would like to see more modern era, mod, what I would consider modern 90s Star Trek instead. But this is still very interesting at the same time. It's an um, interesting premise. Um, eventually, what's figured out here is that because you require a um, navigator to travel through the spore network here, essentially, mm-hmm. um, that it's um, not within Starfleet's kind of parameters as to... Uh, force people. Uh, eventually, they let the alien go. That's helping them right. use the spore drive. Who, who, who's being the slave? Yeah, and they, the guy who literally came up with the spore drive, agrees to you know what? I'll become the navigator and gets connected to the network, in a way. Okay. Uh, but he starts changing and becoming um, uh, different, and ends up altering his biological state and his mental state. Um, to the point where they kind of agree we're not we're not going to use the spore drive anymore because we keep using it. We're actually hurting this other guy. Yeah. Um, and so eventually they eventually Starfleet uh, decommissions the technology because it's too uh, unpredictable, as it were. Okay. So. Um, but again, it's an interesting show thus far, and I am I've seen a lot of clips for it. Okay. Um, so I'm very interested to see more of it. Um, but um, it's still just kind of uh, not available for vast, mass viewing just yet, unless you've got the access to the CBS uh, access sort of thing. Okay. Um, but Star Trek does not disappear. It exists in multiple forms. So I have a, I have a question for you because I'm really curious. So I really liked the character of Q the few times I saw him. Yes. Um, does he ever ever reappear anywhere in the... So he has one. He has one venture onto Deep Space Nine. Okay. Um, there's another character that exists in Star Trek. It's uh, in the next in Next Generation. It's kind of like Captain Picard's like unrequited love interest. Okay. And she ends up traveling with Q for a number of years um, on their journey together because she finds Q interesting. And Q's like, yeah. oh well, I find you yeah. interesting. Why don't you travel? Why don't we travel together? Yeah, um, she makes a return once to to Deep Space Nine, and then Q never appears again on Deep Space Nine. He doesn't like Cisco. Cisco's too. Uh, Cisco doesn't like to play along. Okay. As where Picard would. So he's not fun. Well, Picard like doesn't want to play along either, but Picard kind of knows he's begrudgingly going to have to. Yeah. Um, as well, where, Cisco's his own prophet, right? Well, Cisco's got kind of his own thing going on, and yeah. Um, it also just did not match with the term that, like, where the Enterprise is kind of traveling forever and visiting new places. Eventually, you'll find Q again. Deep Space Nine is in the same place. place. There's no reason for yeah. Q to go back to somewhere once he's been there once before. Okay, got it. Um, but he does make a regular, at least seasonal appearance on Voyager. Um, there's a great two-part episode where uh, the Continuum is having a fight... As civil war, and the way that it manifests itself is as the civil war. Okay. So, um, so at one point here, um, in order for like Catherine J. Way to really kind of comprehend what's happening in the Q continuum, which is kind of like a alternate plane of existence, right? All this fighting and everything happening on it, um. Q makes it representative by the Civil War. 
okay. And so they all get into period piece at that point here. Oh, 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 I, I get it. So they go back in time to our Civil War. Well, no, no, it's... How do I put this in a great way? Um, you ever seen a, you ever seen a uh, Shakespearean play? Uh, okay, do you remember Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio? Yes. Where it was a modern telling of yes. of yeah. Romeo and Juliet, it. but it was got it. Yeah. So that's this here. At the end of the day, it's it's being reenacted via the Civil War, but it's not actually the Civil War. It's just the Q people fighting with one another. Yep, got it. The reason Q does this is to. Um, so there is a contextual way for Catherine Janeway to understand what's happening. Got it. Because if she were to understand it from the cosmic level that Q exists on, her human brain wouldn't comprehend it at the right. end of the day. So this um, Civil War kind of analogy for their fighting and the way it kind of paints itself out is how they relate it here at the end of the day for the crew. They make um, an analogy. Yeah, so everyone... Well, yeah, and, in, 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 in a literal fashion, because everyone's okay. in, everyone's in period piece. Everyone's got like Union colors and Civil War color, yeah, and Confederate colors. Um, Catherine Janeway's in a big ball gown, Southern belle gown, yeah, um, very reminiscent of what the of a period piece at the end of the day. Okay, so it was very much a, a way to do something different, I suppose. Yeah, um, and then Q makes it again like regular somewhat appearance. I think almost every season. In Voyager, her sweep pops up frequently. Okay. I just wondered. Okay. So, um, but no, Star Trek exists in a multitude of fashions here. Um, obviously, there's big fans who are um, of the Starship still. There's a company here that makes them. Very, that one's really cool. Very, very highly detailed here, too. And and then you have you have a, uh, a collection of, of talking Christmas ornaments. Yes. Uh, sounded like Christmas ornaments. Mm-hmm. It's a very, um, very deep collection, I'm told. Yes. Um, going back years and years and years, mm-hmm. um, because Hallmark makes a new one every year. And, yep. and Yeah. So I have, there's a very deep collection of that. Uh, Star Trek has existed for pretty much ever on the internet here, thanks to fan fiction and fan communities. Um, they don't really have very many conventions anymore. Well, and, and I, I always, when you talk about, about conventions, I... I think about Space Galaxy. Yes. With the movie. Yeah, which is very much a... I wish they'd do a second one of those. I, really, I, I think they, it would be really fun if they did one of those, too. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, Space Galaxy being very much an analog for Star Trek, the next, uh, Star Trek, the original series. Yeah. On, on more yeah. than one level. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, even the costumes. The, are, the are, costumes, the yeah. cast, the characters, down to the fan community aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and that... And, and I never haven't been to one of those conventions. I can imagine that that was very much the case. I've seen a lot of um, conventions where they, the characters are there and they'll ask him, like, oh, what would Picard do in this situation? And the cast is like, you know, I'm not, I'm just an actor. I'm not a writer. Yeah. So yeah. I wouldn't know what they would do in this particular case. Yeah. Um, but I imagine it'd be something really cool that that would do. Yeah. You know, uh, which has been aligned before on multiple occasions here. But obviously a lot of these actors have done other stuff here before. So um, they have Wesley, the... Wesley Crusher, regular on, on Big Bang for years. Oh, yeah, I know. And he hosts um, a number of different uh, smaller shows and Brett games. Brett Spinner was on... Big Bang actually had three or four of them on. Oh, no, yeah, no. Jordy uh, LaForge was on. Yeah, I mean, and, and mind you, like, Big Bang Theory would be, like, the prime avenue for this. Yeah. Um, there was an ABC show at one point here. Um, I forget what the... It was a spinoff of the other lawyer show that was on there. Oh, with w- William Boston, Shatner. With William Boston Sh- Legal, so yeah. With Boston Legal. Um, that had a number of Star Trek cast members on oh, it. Oh, did it? Yeah. Okay. Um, some of them unrecognizable. Like um, obviously, William Shatner was there. Um, one of the other guys in the office there was actually um, Odo from Deep Space Nine, who oh, was. Oh, um, I do know because I I liked Odo. Yeah, so had, he was a changeling. Yes, you had Odo there, which was uh, Rene Abrajon. Um, yeah. You even had um, who else was there at one point here? You had. Uh, Armin Shimmer, which was a uh, quark from Deep Space Nine as well. Uh-huh. Um, you you did see uh, Marina Sirtis, who was Deanna Troy from Next Generation. 
So there was a, the cast, almost a lot of the cast appeared on there at one point or another. Interesting. So, um, very, 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 I still love, I still just love how um, irrelevant it is for most of it here. It's just, it's a fun show to watch, if that's nothing else. Yeah. Um, I wish a lot of the characters stayed on there a lot of the time, but, eh, you know, what happens, happens at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, so Star Trek still lives. It lives in a lot of books. A lot of books still come out for for it, much in the same way, like, Star Wars has a lot of books that still come out for it. Um, more recently, though, a there is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game for Star Trek. Oh, you're kidding. Nope. It's very pop. It's somewhat still popular, and it's free to play. Okay. It's called Star Trek Online. Okay. I recently, in doing review for this year, gave it a try. It's not half bad. Okay. Um, you very much pilot a ship, and you go on adventures on the planets, and it's Kind of what you would expect from Star Trek. Okay. Um, you even have to manage a bridge crew and all so like, these different Is it like a Sim City for Star Trek or a little. Okay. But it's a lot of um but a lot of like different like little quests that are basically episodes of a show. They'll start that way too. Okay. So I mean it's a nice, nice little fun diversion. Okay. Um I recently got my brand, I got recently got a brand new ship in there, so I'm kinda happy in that. So I'm, it's again, yeah. if, if, if nothing else, I get a, I get a cool ship. So yeah, there you go. So, um, so yeah, but that this is Star Trek here. It's a very dense topic. I was literally talking about with a person at co uh, coworker at work about what I was planning on. Uh huh. Um, and I guess kind of walked by. I was like, "Wait, are you guys still talking about Star Trek?" And I explained what I do, and he was like, "Yeah, that's a dense topic. Yeah, yeah." So, um. So for you though, homework. I have some homework for you this during this uh, next time. Okay. Um. Now, anybody will ask you, where do you start with Star Trek? You kind of start wherever looks most interesting. Okay. Um, but that is to say, again, obviously the original series, depending on your ability to watch it, will didn't age well by comparison. But that's okay it because it looks hokey now. It, it looks yeah. hokey now. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, next generation stuff looks like very bland by this point here. Um, and as much as I would love for people to like go watch Discovery, that's behind a completely different paywall. Yeah. And the only reason to watch it is if you're already watching stuff on CBS, which yeah, at this point I'm not. Okay. Um, so if I, I like again, I like the '90s Star Trek here. That's my Star Trek for the most part here. Okay. And if you're going to start in there, I'm gonna, let's foc- let's kind of focus on, there's a lot of characters in it. So I've decided to start with Next Generation. Okay. And I've picked some of the better episodes with some help of some friends and some fellow websites. Okay. So I've got uh, five episodes uh, from Star Trek The Next Generation. Okay. I have The Offspring, The Pegasus, The Drumhead, Tapestry, and one of... What everyone considers one of the best episodes in Star Trek in Star Trek of Next Generation, I believe, is the Inner Light. Okay. Um, so these are all not necessarily Picard-driven episodes, but a lot of them are. Okay. Unintentionally. Good uh, actor. Very yeah, Patrick Stewart, great actor. Um, so um, these are the five episodes we have. They're all about forty minutes long. They're all available. Okay. Uh, should all be available on Netflix right now. Okay. Um, and so that's going to be your homework here for the next, for the next week. And, cool. um, I will give you my access to, um, Netflix so you can watch it. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's our homework for ne- for this next week. And oh, we'll very cool. come back. We'll talk about some Star Trek. Very cool. Okay. So, uh, I want to thank everybody again for joining us here for this podcast here. You can learn more about us at nerdtutorialpodcast.com where we post all the show notes and uh, all of our episodes here as well. We also have a Facebook page at uh, facebook.com forward slash nerd tutorial podcast where we try to post uh, stuff regularly happening. Um, I try to post other stuff I'm watching, reviewing, and going through as well so you have a understanding of that. Um, and then if you have any comments, questions, or ideas for future topics, uh, hit me up on nerd underscore tutorial on Twitter and I'll be more than happy to interact and engage with everybody so on behalf of myself your nerdy tutor 
Thank you so much for joining us today. Bye. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.